everyone, it's Anya here at OurGabledHome.com and today I would like to talk to you about kefir. If you have been making kefir or if you have tried to use kefir in the past and you were, let's say, frustrated a little bit by the fact that you needed to make a batch every single day and you had no use for all your kefir, you have come to the right place because I'm going to talk to you about how you can slow your kefir down and not storing it in the fridge for weeks and then having to do a few batches before you get it to where you want it, but actually slowing your kefir down. Now, just about the pronunciation, I always call it kefir. I have heard it called kefir, and I don't think there's a consensus out there as what to call it. So bear with me if you pronounce it something different than kefir, because that is what I'm going to call it. I have a finished batch right here, and because I am currently the only one who is drinking or using kefir, I I'm only making small batches in a pint-sized mason jar. I prefer using glass jars. You don't want kefir to be in contact with metal for any length of time. Using a um, silver spoon or like a metal stainless steel spoon is absolutely fine. That won't hurt it, but you just don't want it in a stainless steel vessel. Now here is the finished batch. Uh, the grains are sitting on top. And here is an older batch that I have that I have in the refrigerator that's about, oh, I probably have about a cup a day. And so I've already had one cup. And here is the remaining cup. This is really simple and I'm sure you'll love this. I just take the kefir grains out and you will realize that when you have kefir that it actually grows pretty fast. So this is probably bigger than I really wanted at this point. It's going to make my kefir ferment a lot quicker. And if I'm not careful, it's going to make it a little bit more sour than I like. And I simply pour it in here. It's okay if there's something on it. And you can see how thick this one is. I typically like to take a whisk and whisk it to make it a smoother consistency, but this one works as well. So as you can see, this one is a lot thicker than this one right here, even though I have used the same amount of time. And what I typically do is I start right here and then I add my milk. In terms of milk, you can use raw milk, you can use pasteurized milk, you can use homogenized milk, you can use cow's milk, goat milk, sheep milk. Kefir is really not particularly picky about what kind of milk. The results will be a little bit different, but you can use any of those milks. We've been using raw milk. I actually love the taste of the raw milk kefir. Let me just shake it up because it's not homogenized. And then I simply fill it up. to about here. And that's really all you do with kefir. And there's another thing I like to mention. There's a lot of dairy products where you want to be working in a sterile environment or with sterile tools and equipment. Kefir is not really that picky. E even though you want to be clean, you don't have to sterilize. Kefir is really forgiving. That's probably because there are so many different strains of probiotic in it, way more than in yogurt. And that's why it is so healthy and healthier than yogurt. And as a result of all the different strains, probably they outdo and compete with the not so beneficial bacteria. Here's my milk and my kefir grains in here. And all I do is I place a linen beeswax wrap on top. I have a video in which I show you how I make this. I like it because it allows some airflow without letting any little critters in or any dirt in. So now what I do is I take it and place it in the refrigerator 
for 24 hours. Then I take it out, place it on my kitchen counter for 24 hours. I place this in a corner of my kitchen. You want to have it at room temperature. In the winter, your kitchen might be a little bit colder and your kefir could take a little bit longer to ferment. In the summer, when it's really warm, it might go a little bit faster. And there's all these different preferences out there. Some like their kefir a little bit milder and some like there's a little bit more sour. And when it becomes more sour, it also becomes a little bit thicker. So that's really a personal preference. What I do like to make sure of is that I keep it away from other ferments. I have a sourdough, so I try to keep it a few feet away from my sourdough. If I have sauerkraut or other ferments like that, going vegetable ferments, I like to keep that also away. And it's good to have designated corners for your different ferments. I just put that in that corner at room temperature. I don't look at it, I just leave it there. And if I need it even slower than that, I will put it back in the refrigerator for another 24 hours. So I actually slow it down where I get a fresh batch only every three days. And I haven't played with more than that. I believe you could do that because you can just pour milk over kefir grains and leave them in the refrigerator. But I don't know if you have to work through another batch before you actually back to how you like your kefir. I believe that you can train your ferments just like I have trained my sourdough where I need it only every, let's say, week or 10 days for my whole grain sourdough. I have another white sourdough that I use more often, but I believe that you can train your ferments and this is why I love this so much and I wanna empower you that you can play with your ferments and make them work for you rather than you working around kefir. And I know a lot of people just end up with so much kefir that they give it all away because it's way too much. And here you can make it work for your schedule and for your consumption. So I, again, like this method a lot better than making a bunch of batches every single day, ending up with a lot of kefir and then storing it in your refrigerator. You can still do that. Let's say you're going on vacation, but here I'm just basically slowing it down. If you put it in your refrigerator or you can even freeze it or dry it, it will usually take a few batches before you're back to where you want your kefir before it has um, become potent enough again, or well, whatever the word is to um, actually be viable. And this is the reason that I like this. Kefir is thousands of years old. It's actually pretty astounding how durable it is and how long it's been around. If you're interested in getting kefir grains, you may know somebody who does have some. There are some neighborhood networks where you could post and say, hey, I'm looking for kefir grains and you'll be surprised how many people will say, oh, I have some because you'll, if you do kefir, you'll have so many grains, you'll be happy to share some. You can also go online. Etsy has kefir grains for sale. I will leave another few resources in the description box below where you can find them. And I have to say that I ordered a batch of kefir grains online that didn't work for me. It was freeze dried and I soaked it and I made one batch and another batch and it came out really yeasty. And I thought maybe there's something about my house because everybody has a different bacterial, beneficial bacterial environment. I just didn't like it. It tasted more yeasty than the distinct kefir taste. And then I got another batch online from some other place and it came in a plastic bag with a little bit of milk. And that batch has been working for me really well ever since. So. The long story short here is if you have a batch that where you don't like the taste, try another kefir grain source and try different ones until you have the one that you really like. And again, kefir is so much more healthy than yogurt because it has so many more strains of beneficial bacteria, probiotics. 
Yogurt needs a certain temperature to ferment, whereas kefir, you can do that anywhere from, I want to say 68 to 75. Don't nail me on the exact number here, but anything that is considered room temperature and it's really not so picky about the fermenting temperature. If you do end up with a lot of kefir grains with a big chunk, sometimes they actually separate in your finished ferment. You may be asking what you can do with them. You can separate them out. You don't really, for this amount of kefir, I don't recommend more than about a teaspoon to about a tablespoon. Again, that's really up to personal preference and your particular kefir grain culture. And you can freeze them so you have an extra batch if something goes wrong and you lose some kefir grains. You can put them in your compost. You can give them to your pet. You can give them to friends and either you can actually drink them. I don't like their chewy texture so much, but I know that people put them in their smoothies in the blender and then you won't even taste them. So there's a lot of good things you can do with your kefir grains other than just throwing them in the trash. And I'm going to give this a taste test just to see how this batch turned out. Mm. It will thicken a little bit more in the refrigerator. So if you like it um, a little thicker than this, that, that's perfect. If you found this video helpful, please give me a thumbs up. If you're new here on my channel, please hit the subscribe button. I upload a new video every week. You can also turn on the bell notification so you do get a notification when I upload a new video. Thank you so much for joining me here in my kitchen and I look forward to seeing you next time.